Good morning. We're going to call the meeting to order. Good morning, everyone. The chair detects a quorum. We will have several excused absences. Senator Henry, um, Eilith McMahon, uh, Senator Kyle all had asked to be excused, and they have been. Um, we have one item of business to take up today behind tab five, and it is the um, continuing discussion of the report on uh, municipal boundary changes and growth planning in Tennessee. By way of reminder for our audience, it, it is about um, public chapter 441, the particular bill that relates to annexation, annexation by referendum, um, but it's about much more than that. And we've all learned a great deal about the, um, the penumbras and emanations, as I often say. But in the broader context still, we are looking, as Mayor Huffman inquired yesterday, at uh, Chapter 1101 in Toto, where we are here 13, 14 years into the 20-year growth planning process. Um, so annexation is a component but there are a number of other aspects that are addressed, and there may be some that we have yet to, to flesh out, and we'll leave it to the members to bring those to our attention. Uh, momentarily, I'll, I'll yield to Ms. Rorick Patrick um, for an overview. We've worked Leah to death. I don't know where she is. She's presented this at the podium every time. There, yep, there she is. Ah, you don't have to hide today. It's okay. Um, but Lenise, uh, wanted to give an overview about where we are and, and what the format is that has been presented and why it's presented in this fashion. Um, and after she does that, I'll, I'll come back and we can discuss our options. I've reread the report this morning for those tuning in. This is posted online, um, just as our proceedings are, are being um, webcast and, and archived. But the, the report itself is 15 pages, not including the uh, appendices. Um, the appendix attached is, is, is rich with, with content. Um, what we're going to be focusing on primarily today, though, is the first 15 pages. And within those pages, the, sh the shadowed or highlighted discussion points, um, which we, we will discuss. They could become uh, the recommendations from discussion, just call them recommendations, or uh, they could become something else. And that's what we'll talk about here momentarily. But uh, without more, I'll yield to Lenise. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to start by just reiterating the, the charge that we had at the last meeting, the plan that was developed by the commission for moving forward to this meeting and preparing for it. Um, We've had several meetings starting in June to discuss these issues. We've had uh, opportunities for people to come before the commission and um, give comments, make suggestions, and answer questions. And there's been a lot of great dialogue, a lot of great discussion. And at the last meeting, we presented a draft report with the idea that we would have a review and comment of it in that meeting and have some direction to the staff to go back and prepare the final report so that it could be approved at this meeting. But because of the, the complexity of these issues, the, uh, the wide array of issues in the report, the feeling of the commission at that time was that we needed further discussion. And so we created a process by which the commission members could um, offer ideas that the staff then folded into the document that you see in front of you right now. The 15-page document that's posted on the web and that was prepared from that series of comments would become the front part of the report once it's revised based on the direction that we're given by the commission today. The remainder of the report, there's still a, another maybe 30-page section of the report that is basically what was presented to you by Leah at the last meeting. And um, what we've done is replace the front part of that report with this discussion document. And um, rather than go through the, the details of it again, uh, in, in, in order to make the best use of your time, what I'd like to do is just walk through the discussion document um, and talk about the um, shaded areas 
so that we can then focus our discussion on where we should move forward with, with that, how they should be revised in order for the commission to be comfortable with them and approve the report. <coughs> Excuse me. So the report begins with just an overview of how this issue came to us. Um, there's a, a block at the top explaining that this document is for discussion and that the um, the, the wording in here related to recommendations or consensus of the commission is preliminary and offered as a jumping off point for the discussion today. It is not an indication that the commission has come to agreement on anything written in these gray areas. <coughs> so uh, taking things in order, uh, starting with uh, what we did in, or in organizing this was basically walk through the elements that um, Public Chapter 441 asked us to look at, Chapters 51 and 58 of Title VII of the Tennessee Code. The first part of Chapter uh, 51 is uh, changing municipal boundaries, which is uh, clearly the, the main focus of the work. The uh, part that isn't shaded in this document, you've already seen before. It's exactly as it was presented in the October meeting. So if we can move to the shaded part, what we've done here is we gathered together all the different ideas that came from the members of the commission, either through the process since October or in the October meeting or, or otherwise. Uh, we take ideas any way we can get them. And we've um, the staff did not comb through them, did not um, try to um, distill them in any way other than just editing them so that they could read together as a whole. We didn't try to pick and choose things. Everything anyone suggested is in here. Um, we would imagine, expect, that there would be even more ideas generated here today. So the first discussion point relating to changing municipal boundaries focuses on or emphasizes the need for a more participatory process, one that gives people more control over whether and when they're annexed. Followed by that is a list of three distinguishable options, and these are, are presented for um, uh, consideration and the possibility that you would want to offer options rather than pick one particular thing to recommend. First is picking up on the main idea that was discussed in the legislature that led to the, in, to the adoption of Public Chapter 441 is annexation by consent only, for example, by referendum inside urban growth boundaries as well as outside them. We all know that Public Chapter 1101 in 1998 created for the first time in Tennessee a process by which some residents, some voters, would be able to choose whether to be annexed or not. That occurs outside the urban growth boundaries that counties and cities work together to adopt in uh, 2000 and 2001. Before that time, there was no opportunity for anyone to vote on whether to be annexed or not. After PC 1101, the area in which a city could annex without going to a referendum was limited to the to inside the urban growth boundary that was created through that process. So what this first bullet would do is say that there's an option that you could require a referendum everywhere, not just outside the growth boundaries, which would be a continuation of the move that um, PC 1101, in a sense, started. The second option is to have a vote on the, or s by some other means, um, approval of the urban growth boundary by the voters, after which unilateral annexation could continue inside the urban growth boundary. This uh, would mean that um, after the coordinating committee had developed the plan, it would be put to the voters, and if the voters approved the plan, then the municipalities would be able to continue to annex as they have been since, um, since Public Chapter 1101 in 1998. The third option would provide for uh, after annexation, petition for removal from annexed areas or from removal from within the urban growth boundaries, provided that removal doesn't create the non-contiguity that we've been concerned about, or unincorporated islands, and that the city is compensated for its investment in municipal infrastructure other than whatever infrastructure would be paid for by the ratepayers who would continue to be on 
the municipality's utility system or what have you. The idea behind this one is that the cities would go ahead and proceed to annex as they have been, but that there would be circumstances under which and a process by which a landowner would be able to petition to be removed from that area, but there would be constraints on their ability to do that so that the cities would not suffer a loss as a result of having annexed the area or put it in their urban growth boundary and extended utilities and what have you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Who would pay that bill if you were buying those municipal infrastructure items back? That, that's a good question and one that we haven't um, come up with a way to, to work out. I know that, in, that there are many other states where de-annexation can be initiated by the landowners. I do not know, and Leah, you can stand up and chime in if you've got the answer to this. I don't know what processes they may have in other states for that purpose. If this were something that the commission and or the legislature wanted to pursue, we would do further research on it to, to come up with ideas. But we're, we're not, we're not saying, all right, so we're not addressing it in this, in this item, this bullet here. I mean, if there's a million dollar worth of infrastructure and you got, uh, you know, 75 homes that have decided to become de-annexed, we're certainly not expecting those folks to pay the million dollars back to the municipality, are we? No, I don't think that's a reasonable expectation. So what this would happen, what would happen in effect is you would not be able to be de-annexed in a situation like that. All right. Bill. I think, I th I think this, is, this is good. What I want to do is I want to get the overview, get through the, the 15 pages generally. If somebody has a, a burning question, go ahead and don't hesitate to ask. But then we'll come back after the overview. Some of these are interrelated and, and take them block by block is what I propose to do. The rest of that block um, suggests that these options could be made a statewide requirement or there could be a process by which counties would be allowed to choose among them. Um, and again, we've um, said by popular vote, this again is, is a jumping off point for discussion. Obviously, there would be other ways that uh, that could be done. Participation, when it occurs, could be through voting in person or by mail or by petition without a vote. If by voting in person, then the referendum should take place during a primary or a general election in order to reduce costs and ensure that the decision represents the widest possible consensus. This again was drawn from the discussion, the concern that you, the concern about having a small handful of people making the decision, making a decision that would affect a large group of people. Any referendum should otherwise follow the process laid out in current law for annexation by referendum. And here, the main thing we were doing was trying to make clear that there is a process in the law already for annexation by referendum. It is extremely rarely used, but it is there. And this is not to say that there wouldn't be a need to visit that process and review it and, and make changes in it as well. Not knowing where the commission would want to go with these recommendations, staff have not done a lot of in-depth work on any one of them to try to figure out what to do. And m our feeling there is, I, you know, this th producing what we have got for you so far from June till now has been a Herculean effort on the part of staff, and we could not, we would not have been able to flesh these out in any level of detail. And I didn't feel it was appropriate for me to ask them to do that or to try to do that, not knowing whether you were going to be interested in these options. The next item is annexation methods, which um, picks up again on the issue of, um, it's just a continuation of the, I of the issue that we've laid out here. If annexation, um, were by referendum, then there would be questions about who would vote. Some, most states require a more participatory process, and so that gave us a lot of ideas to draw from. In some cases, referendums are called for by cities. In other cases, uh, referendums can be called for by the residents, and in, in some states, either one can call for a referendum. 
referendums are held some places in person, some by mail and ballot, and some through a petition process. In some cases, there's a petition for a referendum. In other cases, there may be a petition for annexation so that a, an actual vote would not be required. In those cases, you're going to have standards for the um, percentage of the residents, the voters in that area, or the property owners. Um, you'd have to top that threshold in order to have an annexation occur. Um, what happens in that process is you have this petition for annexation, and if it meets the requirements of the law, then you would take that to the city, and the city would then have an option. Of course, they would not be required to annex simply because people petitioned for it, but they would have an option then and would go through the usual process of annexing by ordinance. And they're generally decided in, three, in one of three ways. In some states, voters in the territory to be annexed approve the annexation. In some cases, voters both in the city and in that territory have to approve it, and the votes are counted separately. In other cases, voters in the city and the territory both approve the annexation, but they are the vote is counted collectively, and there's one, there's one tally of the entire group. The next issue is annexing non-contiguous property. And we approach this partly as a discussion of um, quarter annexation, strip annexation, and trying to take up the concerns that were presented, particularly by the um, county road superintendents and the mayors, the concern about who's responsible for these, these roads where the properties alongside them sometimes are not actually in the city and the people who own those properties are not paying city taxes, and yet the city's responsible for the road. The people in those properties are, of course, paying county taxes. The county highway department, because the road itself has been annexed, isn't responsible for that road anymore. Uh, one of the things that we found in other states, and this frankly is not common, is the authority to annex non-contiguous property. In nearly every state, that's limited to property that is government-owned. It might be city-owned property, and they have the ability to annex that in order to have control and set standards and, and so forth over it. In one state, however, we found that for purposes of creating industrial parks, that they have the ability to annex non-contiguous property. In other words, they do not have to annex something in between in order to reach it and make it adjacent to the city or contiguous with the city. Now, obviously, that raises questions uh, that doesn't clearly resolve all of the questions in relation to the infrastructure that's needed between the city and that non-contiguous area. The discussion point um, reads like this. While recognizing that it will create islands surrounded by unincorporated parcels, in order to avoid the problems created by corridor or strip annexation, the Commission supports allowing cities to annex certain non-contiguous areas, including government-owned property and property for commercial or industrial development with the owner's consent. This is another way of, if a referendum process were adopted, it's another way of getting to a piece of property that someone is willing to sell uh, for, for development and that the city is willing to annex. The general requirements for plans of services should apply to the annexed areas, and the plan should address the unique problems created by annexing them, including provision for road and bridge maintenance and for emergency services, both for the annexed area and for the public infrastructure leading to the area. Um, again, this is a very general um, option, and ag again, it was drawn not from staff, but from the suggestions that were brought to staff for discussion. And the details that, it, that would be required in order to work this out and make it a, a tenable situation have not been developed. They would uh, have to be developed either after the report were done. And I know you want to take into consideration whether that is something that uh, could effectively be worked out. But the option is in here. The next issue is notice period and method. We had some bills in the legislature that specifically raised these issues, so we wanted to be sure to focus on that. Um, the notice period in other states ranges from anywhere as short as one week in Kansas to 60 days in Indiana. Um, Ten states have a minimum of 14 or 15 days notice. Five states require a minimum of 10 days. Nine states require a minimum of 20 and 30 days. 
there's a wide variety of notice periods around the country. And in some cases, they're tied to the particular kind of annexation process that a state has authorized. And in some cases, they're tied, as they are in Tennessee, to the particular method of annexation that the city has chosen. We have a little bit different notice period for annexation by referendum from the notice period for annexation by ordinance. Um, see, two bills, just to, as a reminder, focused on notice of annexation but not notice of the hearings, and it was a little unclear to us exactly what, how you would calculate what the notice period was when it was notice of annexation because the bills weren't, one of the bills in particular didn't specify exactly what you mean by notice of annexation. Is that notice of the date the ordinance is adopted or is it notice of the date that the annexation becomes effective? So if a bill like this were to come, were to move forward, it would need to be uh, more specific about that so that the, the municipalities would know exactly what they were required to do. The discussion point reads that the notice period and method for referendums under current law should apply to unilateral annexation as well. That, that is, by mailing a copy of the resolution in the case of referendum or a copy of the proposed ordinance in the case of unilateral annexation, 14 days in advance of the public hearing. Notice in Tennessee is tied to the public hearing, not to the passage of the ordinance. And there's no particular tie, no particular... Um, law setting out the timing of a public hearing versus the adoption of an ordinance. All of that can occur in the same meeting. So um, what we're suggesting here, what, what the commission has, what members of the commission have suggested to us, is that the only change to be made is to extend the same notice period for the public hearing for uh, annexation by ordinance. Um, as already exists in the law. Right now, it's seven days for ordinance and 14 days for a referendum. And speaking of public hearings, we had a bill that would have added an informational meeting or two to the process. The only state that we know of that has informational meetings is North Carolina. And interestingly, that's a state that only allows annexation by referendum. It's a recent change in North Carolina. <coughs> the bill that was sent to us to study was not specific about what an informational meeting is, so we had uh, no way, it, it was difficult for us to evaluate what that would be different from a public hearing. So what we did was describe what happens in North Carolina. And the North, Carol North Carolina, it's really more tied to our hearing requirement for a plan of services. Um, there's, there are more requirements on the hearing in North Carolina, on, on the informational meeting rather, uh, including that people be provided very specific information about exactly how the annexation process works, specific information about how you go about requesting the extension of utilities to, the, to your properties and, and forms and so forth are distributed in those meetings. It sounded to us more like the public hearing that we have for the plan of services, so we suggested tying it to that. Uh, this is one where we... the. Um, the ideas that came out of the discussion among the commission members was that we should have, um, well, let me just, let me just um, read the discussion point, that we should add a second public hearing for unilateral annexations um, and hold an informational meeting for all annexations. And what we went on to say here was picking up on the idea in North Carolina of what an informational meeting would be. Um, could be combined with the existing requirement for a public hearing on the plans of services adopted by cities for newly annexed areas instead of requiring an additional meeting in advance of the annexation itself. Just take piggybacking on a meeting that already exists. And specific information about North Carolina was added to this document and it's in the shaded area that is not outlined on page six. Next, we take up the issue of providing municipal services. Without going over that discussion in any detail, this is related mainly to the plan of services requirement. And there was one bill that passed, and I don't have the public chapter number on it here. It was Senate Bill 1054 by Senator Kelsey, House Bill 1263 by Representative Dale Carr, 
It had sections in the original bill that would have added some requirements for the plan of services, including standards for delivering the services and information on the financial ability of the city to provide services to the territory they proposed to annex. Most other states also require a plan of services before annexation. 15, including three of the other uh, what we're calling unilateral annexation states, require that budget or financial information be provided in plans of services. Picking up on that notion, the discussion point at the top of the next page suggests establishing a deadline of five years. Actually, that was a specific uh, su suggestion offered by, or an option offered by commission members. Establishing a deadline of five years for, prov for provision of the required services and inclusion of information about the city's financial ability to provide those services in its plan. And I guess. On the um, 10. 1054, um, if, that became, if that was passed and we don't have the public chapter reference, um, it, instead of saying it included sections that would have, shouldn't we say that that's the law? No, because those sections were, were amended out. They were amended out. I yeah, understand. The bill that. passed without those sections. Okay. It was billed as passed related primarily to the timing of taxes on the part of the municipality. Okay. And I'm going to take a little breath here to, to say again, in case I have created any confusion here in the way that I've phrased these things, the ideas came from the discussion of the commission members themselves. And um, I don't want to mislead you into thinking that the, the staff have created these um, without basing them on the ideas that the, the, the members have offered. And in some cases, I should make clear, there has been no discussion among the commission. There is no consensus among the members at this point. These ideas may have been offered by one or two of, or a small handful of members. Related to extension of utilities beyond municipal boundaries, um, we have a pretty simple um, option here, and that is a, su a suggestion that Tennessee not adopt a similar provision. And by similar provision, we're talking about provisions in, in other states um, where, let me go back up in here, Idaho is the only state that's addressed this problem, and they addressed it by making consent to annexation implied in an area connected to a city water or sewer system. And that's contingent on a, um, the request being made by the owner before July 1, 2008, which is, uh, not surprisingly, the date that that particular bill became effective. We were unable to find out anything else about what was involved in that bill, whether it changed their annexation or utility extension process in some other way. As far as we can tell, it didn't. It just said, from this point forward, this will happen. And um, while we provided information about this to the commission members, no one had a comment about it. And so what we've written in here for your consideration is uh, that the commission opposes adopting a similar provision. One of the issues that was raised at uh, in the discussion, I believe in the July meeting, was vesting of pre-annexation development rights. And we have a number of bills introduced over the years on vesting of development rights, mainly related to actions by uh, planning commissions and municipalities to modify their zoning ordinances or their subdivision regulations. But it also becomes an issue, and, and the issue was raised by the developers, um, that if we've started a development in an area that has not yet been annexed, we established the plan to develop that area based on the county's requirements. And then when the city annexes the area, we become subject to the city's requirements, and they're as asking that some, um, some ability become effective at some point to, to remain with the standards that the development was begun under. And the discussion point is a pretty general one. It says that um, the same standards should apply before and after annexation, whether they're the standards of the municipality or those of the county. And that intentionally leaves open, and we're, off, we're, we're tossing this out for discussion. And, and by that, I don't mean discussion of adoption of exactly this, but we wanted to raise the issue of whose standards should they be. Could there be a process by which the standards that uh, if you have, if you're inside an urban growth boundary, for instance, and you know that the city is going to be able to annex that area and have a reasonable expectation that they will, 
should then the standards in that area be the standards of the municipality in the first place rather than those of the county? Lenise, I, I think this sentence needs to be, if it's included, needs to be clarified a little bit. I understand, you know, it, it says the consensus is that the same standard should apply before and after annexation. And you need to be, yeah, it needs to be clarified. I think it's, yeah, go ahead. And that clarification is exactly what we're looking for from the members today. Allocation of tax revenue after annexation, this relates to the hold harmless provisions, which are unique to Tennessee. The um, paragraphs here just briefly review how the 15-year um, period works, what's involved in that, and raises the issue about what's happened to the retail, to the wholesale beer taxes. Um, those have not been, in most cases, distributed in the way that was described in the law, and the reason for that is that the beer wholesalers are, res are the ones responsible for, they're the vendors who collect the taxes, and they s remit those taxes to the county trustee without specific information about exactly which retailer paid how much of that tax. So the no one has the information, or no one has had the information up till now, to be able to divide that properly between the city and the county. And so it's generally being remitted to the city. So our recommendation, or the recommendation that we're putting before the commission, is um, that the current hold harmless provisions are adequate, except that the law establishing the process for collecting, reporting, and remitting these revenues should be changed to make the hold harmless provision easier to implement, including by requiring beer wholesalers to provide information specific to individual retailers. Mr. Chairman, does that, that means locus is what you're referring to? Citus. Okay. And again, in a case like this, where particularly where um, the basic recommendation is to do it as it is, um, there's not a lot of specificity in the recommendation because it's in the law already. Um, but definitely, uh, we need to make clear that the individual retailer should be by situs. Yes. Annexation of agricultural land and other open space. Um, these issues have come before the legislature periodically, um, including a bills to prohibit annexation of land subject to conservation easements. The only bill related to open space currently pending is Senate Bill 1316 by Senator Bowling, House Bill 1249 by Representative Van Hus. This bill would prohibit annexation of land in urban growth boundaries that's zoned for agricultural use until a change in use is triggered by a request for non-agricultural zoning designation or by sale of the land for a different use. One of the issues here is that we have 47 counties that don't zone and if you're in an urban growth boundary outside the city limits that land will not be zoned at all so that bill if it were to move forward would need to be clarified only eight states restrict annexation of agricultural lands several several prohibit annexation of agricultural or rural land and different states use different terms and define them in different ways Two states allow owners of annexed agricultural land to request de-annexation. In Idaho, owners of annexed agricultural land greater than five acres can petition the court for de-annexation. Ohio allows owners of unplatted farm land to petition the court for de-annexation. Those are some examples of the ways that other states have implemented something like this. The discussion point says that <coughs> Land used primarily for agricultural purposes as well as state and federally owned open lands should be subject to annexation only by consent. The expectation is that uh, you know, a, a state park or uh, something in the area that a city wanted to annex that you would work with them and, and get their agreement on that. It would, uh, and it, um, the expectation is that they would consent and that you would go through an ordinance process. Moreover, any such lands currently inside cities' corporate limits should be allowed to be de-annexed or on petition by the owner, again as before, provided that it does not create non-contiguity or unincorporated islands, and that the city is compensated for its investment in municipal infrastructure other than those associated rate-paid services. 
And again, these are jumping off points for discussion. It is not our expectation that, that, it, that uh, an, an option like this would be adopted exactly as it's worded. Deannexation. The commission um, had no specific legislation to consider here, but that is part four of chapter 51, which we were asked to review, and so we provided a, a brief review of that, including a look at other states. 13 states authorize only property owners to initiate deannexation. In Tennessee, deannexation can be initiated only by a city. Nine authorize only cities to do so. 14 authorize either. A majority of states require a referendum or consent to complete the deannexation. It works basically in the same way that annexation would work. The discussion point here is about giving property owners the right to initiate deannexation provided, again, that it does not create non-contiguity or unincorporated islands and that the city is compensated for its investment in municipal infrastructure other than those associated with rate paid services, which we recognize would effectively prevent deannexation of some areas. Mutual adjustment of corporate boundaries is, um, I think I said, the, gave you the wrong uh, part number on deannexation, it's part two. Municipal adjustment of corporate boundaries is part three. Ten other states have specific laws authorizing cities to adjust their mutual boundaries, usually through a simultaneous process where one city de-annexes the property and another annexes it. In Tennessee, this can be done by contract between the two states. And I believe Iowa, Leah, is another state where that can be done by contract. But I believe also in Iowa, it requires some form of consent from the property owners. So I think it is... Correct me if I'm wrong on that. No? No. There's something interesting in Iowa, and I've uh, forgotten exactly what that is. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's a lot of interesting in Iowa, especially if you're running for president. Um, three of the states, um, like Tennessee, have no opportunity for residents or property owners to participate in the boundary adjustment process. Three, um, in three where cities initiate the process, the people can either stop it or must approve the transfer. The discussion point here says, consistent with the recommendation to create a more participatory process for annexation in general, the commission recommends that a public hearing be required before any adjustment of corporate boundaries. <coughs> Merger of cities was not a big issue and um, we have had no specific legislation suggesting a change in that area, and to keep it simple, the uh, discussion point says that the commission finds existing laws governing merger sufficient. Now we shift to the other half of Public Chapter 441, which required us to look at uh, Title Seven, Chapter 58 which is what I think most people refer to as PC 1101. Public Chapter 1101 actually made amendments to public cha to, to, to Title VII, Chapter 51, but, the, uh, it, but it created wholly cha uh, Chapter 58. There is a new block on page 12 that we've added to the Comprehensive Growth Policy section at the beginning of the report that you saw in October, uh, which again is the document that you see here with the gray parts added. Um, this was something that came out of the discussion process and there was uh, an interest in emphasizing what, growth what the Growth Policy Act really did. And what it says here is that it sought to structure decisions about service levels and development, including annexation, in a local but comprehensive process. Decisions about annexation powers are decisions about local government service levels and economic development potential that have countywide implications. The areas established by the urban growth boundaries, by definition, were to be capable of and appropriate for urban services provided by a city within a 20-year planning horizon. The law requires representation of many key stakeholder interests through the mandatory composition of the coordinating committee, the public hearing process, and the required approvals of the local governmental legislative bodies. Other than through public hearings, there's no direct participation by affected residents and property owners. The Growth Policy Act does not require popular approval of the decisions reflected 
in the designation of rural areas, planned growth areas, and urban growth boundaries in the reverse in the in the growth plans. I want to point out again that outside the urban growth boundaries, the Growth Policy Act, through adoption of these plans, did create areas where annexation by referendum is the only option. Moving on to the specifics in terms of the status of the plans, uh, what happens at the end of 20 years and so on and so forth, and revision of the plans, the, um, the option that you see at the bottom of page 13 drawn from the discussion of the members is that all growth plans should be reviewed and either revised or readopted within two years and every five years thereafter. The two years part relates to a specific suggestion that was um, put forward by one of the members. The commission also recommends allowing cities on their own initiative to unilaterally retract their urban growth boundaries and allowing individual property owners to be removed from within urban growth boundaries by petition to the city. Again, so long as removal does not create non-contiguity or unincorporated islands or cause problems with delivering urban services. The dis um, a minor question. In the second paragraph above the block on page 13, the, at the end of the paragraph, the last sentence, um, <laughs> The, the last phrase of the last sentence. It just says, and to serve on the coordinating committee. I c it, the sentence doesn't read right to me. And I'm, I'm doing. Oh, um, we can clarify that. The bill brought by Senator Watson and by Representative Carter would have prohibited a muni municipality that hasn't annexed all the territory within its urban growth boundary to propose an amendment to the growth plan, and it would have pre prevented the mayor of that municipality from serving on the coordinating committee. Okay. That, that was the mm -hmm. and to serve on the coordinating committee wasn't mm -hmm. clear to me. I see. Well, we'll just clarify that. Okay. okay. Following that discussion point, we separately sectioned off a discussion point in a large block on page 14. Um, this was a fairly specific idea that came from one of the members, and um, staff tried to meld all of the concepts that were offered by the members into a single um, recommendation, but this one was a, a little bit difficult because it calls for popular approval of the growth plans, and it was our feeling, this is the one judgment call that we made in here, was that we could not combine the popular approval of the growth plan with a requirement to readopt the growth plan every or revisit the growth plan every five years as a practical matter you would not want to have popular approval of a something every five years so that was a judgment call on our part just to um, try to pull these things together so we've separated this idea out Again, um, because urban growth boundaries create areas in which unilateral annexation is allowed, um, the recommendation there is making the revision process a more participatory one. And the following process is offered as an example of one way to link popular approval of growth plans to the annexation method so that unilateral annexation may continue where urban growth boundaries receive voter approval. And this, again, was an idea offered by one particular member. And the process, we've sort of reorganized it a little bit here um, in order, again, to make it work with the every five years. Uh, the first step would be growth plans adopted as they have been by coordinating committees and submitted to the local legislative bodies for approval according to the provisions in current law. Second, then, the counties would hold general countywide elections to approve the growth plans adopted by the local legislative bodies. In that third step, it's a kind of an either or. There's a provision for if the, gro if the voters approve it and a provision for what happens if they don't. If the voters approve the new plan, then annexation within any voter approved urban growth boundary continues under current law. Otherwise, the existing plan remains in place. You wouldn't want a situation where you had no plan at all. And annexation can occur only by consent, which would be by consent of an individual property owner and then annexation by ordinance or by referendum for a, an area where you had uh, a mix of owners, some of whom were willing and some weren't. 
Step four, the same sanctions applicable to local governments that did not timely adopt an initial growth plan back in 2000, 2001, are reinstated in any county that does not have a voter approved growth plan. The um, option that came to us was not specific about that, but pretty clearly what that means is the grants and things that you had to have a plan to be eligible for, you would become ineligible for if you didn't have a voter approved plan. And I, I, I guess that was the incentive to try to create a plan that the voters would approve. The fifth step would be that the moratorium imposed by Public Chapter 441, Acts of 2013, continues in each county until the revised approval process is completed there. And again, uh, our understanding is that that was offered again as an uh, incentive to ensure that uh, the process were followed. The issue of coordinating committees has been raised and, and uh, in relation in particular to the concern that the reason that some of these plans haven't been revisited more often is that they that it's a complex process and requires a lot of people to participate in it. Um, and without going into a lot of detail there, we don't have references to other states because we're the only state who has a process like this. Um, the discussion point is that the commission recommends no changes to the composition of the coordinating committees, and this comes from the fact that no particular options were offered to staff by the members. The last piece relates to the joint economic and community development boards. The discussion here has been that some of them are highly productive and others are perhaps not as much needed. And there was concern, again, one size doesn't fit all. Some need things to work one way and some need things to work another way. We had talked in the meetings about a uh, situation where you don't have uh, economic growth or you don't have a lot of economic growth going on in the area at the time and you may have not a lot to get together and discuss as often as the law currently requires that you do it. The discussion point there, um, and there was some discussion about the difference between the coordinating committees and the joint economic and community development boards and the only um, suggestion that came from the commission members was um, the possibility of moving the functions of the JECDBs to the coordinating committees. So the discussion point reads that um, the commission allows recommends allowing local governments to decide for themselves how often the JECDBs and their executive committees should meet and whether to move the functions uh, to the coordinating committees responsible for developing the growth plans. And that's with that, we'll have questions. All right. Um, several ways to proceed at this point. I want members to be able to go back and talk about any particular questions they have or, or different ideas. Um, the Public Chapter 441, as amended, requires TASSER to respond to the General Assembly, make recommendations, and propose particular legislation, if any, by January 14th, setting the stage here. As a practical matter, that would mean to meet that deadline in that fashion, uh, our group today would have to approve uh, what is submitted by the 14th um, in order for it to be reprinted and finalized and distributed timely. Um, we had talked in October about the, the problem that that presents because our next meeting is currently scheduled is not until the end of January. I think it is it the 30th and 31st, a couple weeks after the deadline. Um, this report in in one sense could be if approved by the commission, um, you know, by converting some of the shaded areas from discussion points to recommendations, it could be submitted. And I think comply with the, the, uh, the requirements of public chapter 441 as amended. Um, but at the same time, I've heard several members express um, sentiment that they'd like to drill down further. Uh, they may want to change some of these, but even the ones that, that apparently there is some consensus on people would like to work on them more and 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 have more detail um, so we've got several options and and I think probably the best way to proceed parliamentarily is for us to uh, chair to entertain a motion that we adopt this report 
we're not voting on it yet, but to get something before us that we can actually discuss um, in toto, I would entertain a motion that we that we accept the report um, and then have have discussion about it. All right, properly moved and seconded. Any discussion on the motion? All right, hearing none. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstain? Fine. All right. Now then, the report is before us for, for further discussion, and I'll yield to anyone seeking uh, recognition. Mayor Huffman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a question I had on the last one, the uh, JECDBs. Have, have we ever looked at, has TASSER ever looked at allowing the J, the Joint Economic Community Development Board to also be the Industrial Development Board? I know those are two different statutes completely, and I know, and I think in the Industrial Development Board statute, elected officials are prohibited being on there, and on the JECDB, they're mandatory that they constitute that board, but if we got one board that's not doing a lot in some areas, and we got an ID board, it might be that those two functions seem to me like they're awfully, could be awfully similar. Uh, what would be the possibility of looking at seeing if that would be an option for a local area where the Joint Economic Community Development Board also served as the Industrial Development Board. Right. And it's so different in different areas. It might work in some areas, might not work in some areas. Right. All right, so we'll consider whether that could be an, a local option. Um, and as as you mentioned it, Mayor, it would be that industrial development boards be moved to the JECDBs. Could the reverse be true? I'm I'm thinking out loud, which is dangerous. It it, it it's possible, but it, you'd have to. One of those is going to have to be changed, regardless of what you do. And keep in mind, your industrial development board. Now that's a board that uh, it you know it can issue debt. It's the conduit that you use when you got a company coming in that you use payment lieu of tax structures are set up through that tax exempt board. So it's going to get a little, you know, it's going to have to be looked at uh, and, and gotten into. But I'm just thinking if there are some areas where the Joint Economic Community Development Board just meeting just to be meeting, and you've got an ID board that also meets, uh, is it possible or is it too much trouble, quite frankly? And we're making it harder if you were able to combine those functions with a local option. Thanks. Without, you know, of course I'm familiar with IDBs, um, but I sure don't have the specifics of it uh, in, in my mind. But it would seem that one possibility for the commission would be to recommend that that be offered as an option. And if the commission sets that out as an option to allow a local uh, legislative body to adopt, then if the legislature is interested in moving forward on that, then we could all work together on exactly how that would happen. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't be necessary for us to be real specific in the report about that. It could be a, just a recommendation. As, as That's as right. As and it's, there may be some counties where you've got a city industrial development board, but no county board, because you all use the same board is the conduit. There may be some areas where you've got a county board, but you don't have a municipal board. And so it's going to be all over the all over the place in terms of what each individual local government is doing. But that I think that might be a viable option in some areas. So why don't we take that as a, as a friendly amendment, a proposal to add here a bullet point that, that we create language suggesting a, an option for locals to, to combine those where appropriate. And the General Assembly consider legislation to facilitate that. Mayor Bragg. I, I wasn't there when this was proposed, but the, the IDB is no elected officials, and the Joint Economic Board is a requirement. I, I don't see how the two fit together, and I, I, I just defer to the chair. Uh, I, I think that and and I don't think IDBs are everywhere. I don't think everybody's got an IDB. So from that point of view, it may be uh, opposing interest, shall we say. It could be, and, and it would require more study, um, certainly giving it a, as an option where it, where it might work um, doesn't seem to do, to, to do any harm. That 
there's an underlying concern about economic development throughout this whole discussion that we haven't really talked about. I don't recall talking about specifically here, but to, to what extent does the current construct facilitate economic development? There are those who say that this is this is what's driving the economic engine in the state, the construct that we have. There are others who, who are skeptical about that and, and, and aren't quite sure, but with the renewed there's always an emphasis on economic development, but there's a current focus on it as it relates to workforce development and education and everything else that that it surfaces some of these questions. You know, it could be that the recommendation of TASR would be General Assembly just do away with the Joint Economic Community Development Boards altogether. I remember that was discussed early on because are they really doing any good? But I'll yield to Vice Mayor Rowland on that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a clarification that Mayor Huffman brought up earlier about who's going to reimburse municipality for the investment made in a de-annexed area, and just food for thought, it, it, not, it wouldn't necessarily just be infrastructure, it could be a fire station, which would be very expensive in that area, but that's food for thought. Also, I serve on the IDB and my county mayor serves on the IDB. Are we violating the law? Uh, we'll take that up in private session. Thank you. <laughs> well, I don't mind stepping down. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, I think we should add, uh, let's, uh, if there's not a, any objection, we, we need to add a, a talking point about it, for lack of a better way to put it, in this, in this area. It needs to be considered further. Yeah, that's fine. I, I don't want to muddy the water. I know we're trying no, to clear helpful. the water, but. No, it's good. It's good. All right. Um. Other, yes, Representative Carter and then Senator McNally. Uh, first, uh, I, I feel compelled. I was on a radio show the other day and some guy called in and was very upset about Tasser and the quality of the work it did. And I told him that this is my first time on it, but that I was amazed at the quality of the work we received and the discussion of opinions, and I was proud to be a part of it. He needed to study a little more before he made any comments. If it was outside my district, I don't think I've <laughs> lost any vote there, but perhaps I was a little too firm with him. I did want to say that because I think this is one of the fairest, most detailed background studies that I've ever seen, and to Lanisha and your staff, I very much appreciate that. Thank you very much. At this point, in order to move the discussion along and for lack of a and other thought on, on page three where we have our discussion point, uh, the consensus of the commission is that Tennessee should adopt a more participatory process, one that gives people more control over whether and when they are annexed. Three options uh, are discussed there, and I think those are excellent discussions. I would move that we uh, look at this in two phases. 1101 is a great law. It took a, it almost unscrambled an egg. I, I think it, it, it's an excellent work. I would be very concerned about making changes to it without great study and particularly the mayors, the counties, and the cities really looking at that because everything we do, it's like debits and credits. If we credit something, we gotta debit something. We gotta make sure we don't have unintended consequences. Uh, just to expose my profound ignorance in 441, 1101 never entered into my mind uh, in that. I simply wanted no annexation without uh, those parties in that area approving it by uh, referendum. Now that I've gotten into it and talked to a, a lot more small mayors, small town mayors than you all might think, uh, there are some, some problems in it that need to be addressed. Do they need to be changed? I'm not sure, but everyone needs to be able to have their say. So uh, I would propose that we take a two-step approach. Number one, that we go ahead and amend 651-102, I think it is, or whatever it is, to say that any non-consensual annexation of homes, primarily homes or agriculturally used property, be approved by a referendum of those registered voters owning property within the annexed area. Uh, to me, 1101 needs to be referred and we need to ask for additional time if I'm still on the board to consider that and make sure that we don't, uh, we don't do something that creates tremendous unintended consequences. As I was reading the report the other night, I noticed, and I read it with great interest, all the reports that have been filed, that even in 1996, the Speaker of the House and the Speaker of the Senate got together and said, we've got a problem on voting on annexation. Let's take a look at that. That led to committees, that led uh, essentially to the adoption of 1101, but still no right to vote. 
we're never going to get away from this until we deal with it. And, and I respectfully recommend to the commission that we pr we present to the our to the House and the Senate our recommendation that annexation be by consent only approved by the referendum of those within uh, the area to be annexed. Thank you. Just point of clarification, Representative Carter. I are you saying that, that that should be the only discussion point recommended there or that it, sh it should just be rephrased slightly as you stated it but still included with, with these options? Uh, no, I, I would want to present it just like I phrased it. Number one uh, is, is the recommendation or the motion, if that's appropriate. I don't know that that is appropriate at this time, but that would be the motion that I would have that, that we would present. And finally, end this and allow people to vote on something as serious as annexation and the effects that it has on them. Thank you. Well, I, th I think what he's talking about is, is, is rephrasing the first bullet point uh, to read as he stated it and deleting the other two um, is, w is what I think. Now, I'll we'll get clarification on that. My um, consideration of presenting several options I mean, I've previously expressed my, my personal preference, which is consistent with, with Mike's, but I'm sensitive to Tasser um, deciding among the options and telling the General Assembly that this is w the one that, that they should choose. I think they should see the options, despite you know my, my personal preferences, um, so that they have something to compare it to. Um, I'll yield to Mayor Rowland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Carter, just for clarification, your motion, does that include the present urban, go urban growth boundaries or is it uh, outside of those areas? No. Yes, sir. As you know, Mayor, if you go outside the urban growth area, you must give a referendum. All I'm saying is apply the same law that was adopted in 2000 to both areas. Change nothing, but bring it inside the urban growth boundary as well as it currently is outside. Uh, my research <coughs> showed there have been four votes outside the urban growth boundaries since 1101 was passed, three passed by wide majority, well, two passed by wide majority, one passed like 52, 48, and one failed by a wide majority. So we do have history of four referendum in Tennessee, uh, with the city being successful 75 percent of the time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any further questions on, on that, uh, Chairman Sargent? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know uh, Representative Carter and I have taken opposite sides on this issue. And for mine's coming from a very different side, maybe. Uh, in front of everyone is a letter from the Middle Tennessee mayors, if you look at it. And this is from Davidson, Cheatham, Murray, Montgomery, Robertson, Rutherford, Sumner, Williamson, and Wilson. If you think of it, and I'm going to go to a, maybe a little different term, but if you think of it, this is the economic growth probably here in the state of Tennessee. Probably 60% of all the population, I'd say at least two-thirds of all the population growth in the state of Tennessee in the last 10 years, two-thirds of it probably come from those counties right there. These counties have worked together very closely the urban growth, urban growth boundary lines have have worked. They've met. The, the city planning commissioners have met. They work with the county planning commission when lands are supposed to be uh, inside the urban growth boundaries. When land is being looking at annexation and there's going to be a subdivision, the counties and cities work together. The you know. Uh, cities try to get the uh, counties to uh, go in their planning and build it to where it will fit the city uh, zoning and regulations uh, when it is annexed in. And what I don't want to do, this has worked very well. And as you know, outside the urban growth boundaries, you know, you have to take a vote. I personally, and I think most of my mayors, my city mayors, my county mayors inside the donors, say, around Davidson County, this has worked very well, and we have a, a city mayor here that's inside there. We have a county mayor uh, that would maybe like to pick up on this. And these are plans that have been going on for long, for a long period of time. We know where we're going to annex and how the growth is going to be. It's no different than I'll use uh, 
Highway 8, State uh, Route 840 has come through Williams County and come through some of the cities. They have all worked together and looked at planning and zoning in those areas because going back in the Williams County, I'll use an example, every five years they go back through their planning. Well, all of a sudden we have a, I'm not going to call it the interstate because it is State Route 840, and we had commercial land out here now that was zoned rural, and it was, you know, one acre, one house per five acres, and, you know, some of this had to be redeveloped. They had public hearings. They, they held public hearings uh, in all different areas of the county. They all came back and worked together. We had a, a community crossroads, what they call a community crossroads, where there were new uh, development, and they went to a hamlet, and they, they figured out a way to get your commercial property out there, your, you know, your little convenience store, your gas station, and things of this nature. So the problem I had last year was they wanted to make this for everybody. And normally over the years, we've been able to eliminate counties and over cities from different laws, and people say, well, it's unconstitutional. Well, w we can use that on a lot of things we do up here, a lot of things are unconstitutional. But if we're going to do something, I, those who have a problem, and I know there are some problems, but those who have a problem, let them opt into something instead of letting us opt out, if you want to put it that way. It has worked very well in these areas, and I, I know I, I represent a complete different area. I mean, I have growth of our schools probably over half the counties haven't grown total population in the last 10 years as my school has grown in the last 10 years. And we've gone from 21,000 students to 33,000 students, and a lot of counties haven't grown 12,000 people. And it's worked in a, you know, in a very metropolitan type area like this. And this has worked, this plan has worked well. And I haven't had the complaints, and I don't know where some of the complaints are coming from, but I want to say 1101 has worked excellent in these areas and, you know, I know a rural area is a little different, and I, I, don't, I won't even try to speak for that. But, you know, I, I don't want to get into, you know, I have nothing against uh, voting outside the district, but I think th this has been in place 15 years that people knew this was coming. They've had public hearings, and they continue to have public hearings on this. Uh, and then, you know, I, I just don't want to mess this. Uh, what we have is such a, a good situation here in Middle Tennessee. I'm not going to speak for anywhere else, but I think Mayor Burgess and uh, uh, Mayor Brad can speak on that, how, how well I think it's worked now. You know, they're both the county mayor and city mayor. I think they can explain it probably more eloquent, eloquently than I and better than I, but I think it's worked in these areas. Uh, Senator McNally was seeking recognition. You are recognized. Thank you. Um, I think, first of all, uh, I'd like to see the one-year moratorium extended uh, because I don't know that, let's say, the legislature gets this report in February, is it? The current 441 says January 14th. January 14th. Whether, whether there'd be a lot of time for the legislature to act before that mor moratorium runs out. And in... And secondly, you know, I would favor Representative Carter's uh, annexation by by a by consent only by some type of vote with the people in the uh, area affected. But I don't believe it would probably pass this committee. And maybe the the best thing the committee could do is to go over some of these alternatives. I think everybody's agreed that. You know the the public has a right to participate in the process, and it's just how one defines the uh, the public in this case. And uh, I I would uh, 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 propose first. Uh, well, I guess there's a motion on the table, but, but we don't have a second. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Well, I w I I think it, it's it's. A, critically important that we give the legislature enough time to act and uh, and not uh, you know force them to to rush something through and and uh, I know for, for the 1101 took quite a bit of study uh, 
by this committee and by the legislature and maybe delaying for another year, continuing the, the moratorium and provide them with some alternatives would be the, the best function that this committee could do. Thank you. Right, thank you, Senator McNally. Mayor Rowland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I agree with Senator McNally that uh, we, we've covered a lot of territory. Staff has done an excellent job. We still have a few questions not answered yet, not to the uh, satisfaction of everybody. And uh, I certainly agree that if the moratorium is extended another year, it gives the legislature more time to study it and gives us more time to make further recommendations about these just very few issues that we have a concern about. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mayor Bragg, were you, I, your name was called, but I didn't, okay. I didn't know if you wanted to respond. Mayor Burgess. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to direct your attention to page 12 of the original report where it tells us how many annexations took place in Tennessee 2000 to 2009, that 10-year period. 88 of our counties had less than 100 annexations in that whole 10-year period. Only seven counties had more than 100, and if we go back and reflect on what uh, Representative Sargent was saying, you can see that three of those counties are in Middle Tennessee, and I just want to say that uh, I'm only into my second term as being mayor of Rutherford County, and Rutherford County, uh, with its municipalities, uh, have had somewhere between 100 and 250 annexations. I've not had a single call from a single disgruntled citizen about being annexed in that county, and I just think it's worked immensely well, the system and process that we have, and I just want to encourage us to at least out, uh, I'd prefer an opt-in if you choose to have a referendum on every annexation, but uh, at, at a minimum, give us an opt out if you choose to, uh, the legislative body chooses to uh, implement such a proposal here. Mayor Beats of Kingston. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. If proper, uh, I would, and uh, Senator McNally is making that as a motion, sir, I'd be honored to second it. In the nature of a substitute motion. <laughs> <laughs> moved and seconded that we suggest we recommended the legislature that the moratorium be extended for one year representative Haynes thank you mr. chairman was there not a motion on the floor from representative Carter and if there was could we restate that I, I know I, I don't believe it got a second it but, did but, but could we restate that, that no, now there's a now there's another motion that has been seconded so Further discussion and and uh, it's the will of the body. There's a motion to recommend the continuation of the moratorium for one year. And again, it's just a recommendation. You know, the General Assembly would have to modify what is now Public Chapter 441. Chairman Sargent, you seek recognition. Uh, I understand this is a, c a compromise, but I know one of my cities. Well, it's not I actually in my district, but I count Williams County as my district. Uh, had to put off an annexation because they just wanted to see what was happening. Uh, it's the town of Thompson Station, and they were getting ready to annex some land, and they just said, well, you know, we'll just hold off. It wasn't an emergency situation, but I think there is a person looking at it. And I know we can go back to it a different way, so I'm going to try to do that. But just because I know the way growth is in Williams County, now, in that motion, this still will take out commercial property. Am I correct? The current that moratorium, was the uh, uh, that's correct. Commercial is excluded. That's correct. That's the current law. And, and I appreciate the motion, but I'll probably vote no against the motion strictly because I know I have a, a city that's uh, not in my district but in my county looking at uh, some of this. Thank you very much. Remember, this is the Tennessee Advisory Commission. Okay, I know some of us legislators tend to forget that when we're sitting here holding these mics and voting, it's like we're actually in battle, but we're trying to give instruction to the General Assembly when it reconvenes on January 14th. Editorial comment, Mayor Bragg. Uh, one other thing, and I just want to point out, there is redress through, through the courts for annexations uh, uh, by ordinance. Uh, when you do take residential property or agricultural property, you always can go to the courts. And we have a situation in Rutherford County in Murfreesboro where uh, a, 
two hundred plus homes were surrounded by the city because of annexations by request and those uh, that annexation, I believe, was uh, done in 2006, and that's still in the court. So I, I just hesitate many times to, to rattle with laws because they get tied up in the courts and we don't ever get a resolution. I think a lot of people still remember that many of the cases from Knoxville from 20-plus years ago are still tied up in the courts. So. Uh, we, we have that resolution. Those that we annex because they got surrounded are not in the city because they have filed suit, uh, quo warranto, and uh, that's always a remedy. They're not paying property taxes. They're not receiving city services. So uh, we might just keep that in mind as we look at this uh, referendum issue. And I think cities and counties gave up a great deal when we agreed to uh, the rural areas and the planned growth areas to allow uh, annexation by referendum in those areas. So uh, in, in looking at it largely from a compromise point of view, I believe 1101 has been correct. It was a notice bill, and uh, our people understood that if they lived within an area that was close to the city, they virtually were in the city. and if by some reason of an annexation being enclosed into the city, they, they were s still in the city. So that, that's something that really concerns me a little bit. I appreciate Chairman Sargent's uh, comments and Mayor Burgess because I believe it has worked very well. Uh, we did have one area of about 30 houses, I believe, that got surrounded that, that, that actually went to court with Quo Warranto and then after about four years, just decided they'd come in the city. We've heard no complaints from them regarding city taxes. Uh, city taxes in Murfreesboro are about $50 a month for a $200,000 house. So you can uh, compare that to the cost of a cable bill, uh, to water bill, to whatever else you want to compare it to to get uh, ISO 2 fire service, to get garbage pickup, yard waste pickup, uh, codes, engineering, uh, public safety. Uh, there's just a lot of things involved there, and we've had no complaints in the city of Murfreesboro once they've been taken into the city uh, because they've been surrounded by the city. So I just hope we'll consider that. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Bragg. Any further discussion on the motion to amend to include Senator McNally's uh, motion that we recommend to the General Assembly that the moratorium imposed, I'll recognize the moment, moratorium imposed by Public Act 441, which was the moratorium from April 15th, 2013 through May 15th, 2014, be extended by one year. I've restated the motion. Mayor Representative Carter first, and then Representative Odom, please. Representative Carter. Um, on the extension, I don't know what times are going to work out by legislation and all that. Could we uh, consider amending the motion to say that the moratorium would continue until a bill is passed so that there will be no time between the two. You see what I'm saying? If we were to pass a bill two years from now or whatever it works out to be uh, in April, but the governor doesn't sign it until June or July, then we're going to have a period there uh, that's going to create all kind of questions and issues. And so uh, I would... Uh, uh, just point that out to us. Thank you. Representative Odom. I don't want to be a stickler for detail, but it would seem to me that if we were going to adopt that language, we ought to explain why we are recommending that the uh, moratorium be extended, uh, that we want to spend more time uh, formulating a more detailed uh, advisory uh, position to the legislature, but not just uh, suggest we we just want the extension. Representative, could we, to that point, uh, in, in, after we vote on this, on Mayor, on Mayor McNally, Senator McNally's motion, well, it depends, um, then get back to the remainder of the report and, and say that we are considering these as recommendations, you know, it would give us time to consider what has been set forth, something to that effect. Okay. And I think to 
Representative Carter's point, that would have to be you know, dealt with in the actual legislation amending public chapter 441 that maybe it's uh, until a bill is passed, you know, not, I don't know how we do it, not, not less than one year, but as soon as a bill is passed, something like that, so to have some certainty. Is that generally clear to enough that you feel comfortable? Yeah, yeah, all right. All right then, I'll try it on a voice vote. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Good. The ayes have it. All right. Now, the report is is amended to that extent. Is there further discussion desired at this point as to these other shaded areas, whether it it will be Tasser's recommendation that we do these things, or Tasser's recommendation that we give further consideration or some combination of the two? Mayor Bragg? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to clarify if, uh, if for the purposes of the Commission's recommendation that it would be registered voters who are property owners who get to vote. That would be a motion. Now, w this is, uh, let, let's, let's clarify that further. Sarah McNally? Yeah. What, what about the case where the property's in my wife's name because she earns all the money, but I'm a registered voter? Would both of us get to vote or just the one? <laughs> just the one. <laughs> and, and how would, <laughs> well, she votes a lot better than I do, I think. How would the, Election Commission then make that decision. Uh, they'd have to look at a registered voters list as well as a uh, the as well as a property owner owners list. Senator Tracy seeks recognition. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have a question. Like, yes, if sir. we have a community in my district that they're widening the road they're wanting to put sewer out that road during if there is another moratorium can they go ahead and annex that to put sewer there they want to go ahead and do it because of the economic growth in particular area uh, this community has been working on this we've been working on this road for since you were chairman of transportation so we want to get it widened uh, it affects Nissan, Nissan's growth area. If there is a moratorium, my question is, can they go ahead and annex that property to put sewer there? It is a, would it be commercial? I don't know. I, I want to ask Well, it depends on what they're putting sewer to, I suppose. But I would think th the initial answer would be no. Um, now, they can extend it on other terms, I mean, if, if there's no objection. But I don't think they can annex to do it. Uh, Representative Carter, your yeah, point. That presupposes that annexation is necessary for the institution of utility. And the two, it's oil and water. They don't exist together. They do in practicality. They do not in law. If you want to run the water, the sewer, you can do so. It has nothing to do with annexation. Remember, the law says that utility must stand alone and on its own without the municipality behind it. So I'm confused by that. Now, secondly, we never intended to harm economic development. That's why we left all the commercial development out of the property, even though there are great questions about whether that's a valid argument or not, just for the perception of it. We're only protecting homes used pri or properties used primarily for residential purposes and uh, agriculture. So, yes, it's and finally, and l I'm, I'm sorry, l l let me just clarify this. Remember that there are four ways to annex. The only thing 441 deals with is adversarial annexation. That's the only thing it deals with, people that don't want to be annexed. If you want to be annexed, if I'm a developer and I want to come into the city because I can build 10 more houses per 10 acres or because of density, all I've got to do is go to the city and write them a letter and tell them I want to come in. We're only standing up for those who are being taken in adversarially. Consent has never been a part of this. Commercial development has never been a part of the moratorium. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And it bears repeating that it's adversarial annexation within urban growth boundaries, just again for the public's edification. Um, Senator Tracy? That just needs to be clarified, and 
I, I get questions about that all the time. I know all the other legislators from Rutherford County have had that question, and it is a big deal in Rutherford County where the growth area is growing in that particular area. We're widening the, widening the road for growth, so that needs to be clarified because a lot of people have misconceptions on that as we speak today. Right, and I think that can be, um, even in the, the text of this report, if, if uh, early on, um, in the discussion of annexation methods, although although it is discussed, maybe we punch it up a little bit, tighten it up, and state right at the beginning what this is about and what it's not about as it relates to annexation. Because a lot of people don't realize, as we although we've said it, 1101 actually began to reduce or restrict um, municipal annexation um, by ordinance. In other words, they don't realize that before 1101, cities could endeavor to annex wherever they chose. 1101 actually began to impose restrictions through the establishment of rural and planned growth areas. So we're just looking at those urban growth districts, but I think we can clarify that in, in our verbiage. Now, another point, a good, good example of what needs further discussion. In several of these discussion points where we talk about voting, it would be helpful to hear um, from the, the Office of, of Elections, maybe from the Attorney General. There are questions about who votes, um, how they vote, whether it's a countywide vote, whether it's a dual majority vote. There are a lot of issues there. Now, bear in mind the General Assembly can endeavor to work those issues out through their committee processes too, but I really think in referring this to us, the General Assembly was asking for help given the, the, the demands on our time in these uh, modern day sessions where we're adjourning in April instead of uh, July or August, as we did in some of my early years. Um, that's what TASR is designed to do, is to help refine the issues so the General Assembly has options from which to choose in an educated fashion. So, so we still have before us the remainder of the report. And if you would like to um, adopt it with the caveat that it is for further uh, analysis and, and discussion, subject to the, the one-year moratorium being extended. Keep in mind, the General Assembly may not agree with that recommendation. You may get in on January 14th, and, and the, the bill is run. Um, uh, no, you know, that the, either that the, the request to extend 441 for a year is, is put forth and it doesn't pass, um, or for some other reason there isn't a, a, an additional one-year moratorium. The General Assembly would still need something to fall back on. And so consider, if you will, whether this report could say, instead of discussion point for discussion purposes only, that these are consideration, these are items for further consideration or items for consideration and further discussion, that kind of thing. I mean, I, yeah, I think it's a very good report. It's very helpful in beginning to focus members' attention. What is the will of the body? If the body has a will, Mayor Burgess. Uh, any number of these discussion points, I think, are ready to go. But there are a few of them that I'm just really not sure about. Just a simple thing under the discussion point on page eight, where it says the commission recommends establishing a deadline of five years for the provision of the required services. I don't even know where to start to begin to define what is required services. Somebody's going to have to really drill down there before that could be practical. Yeah, yeah Mayor Beats. Yeah. Well, if I just had one more. Uh, and then this business where we talked about in at least two of them that w the utility or the municip municipality would have a right to recover its investment costs. I don't, I mean, that's going to take a huge amount of effort, somebody defining how that process works and who's going to pay for that. So I'm not saying anything's wrong with it, but as long as someone clearly understands that some of those things need much, much more deliberation before we say we are sort of endorsing that concept. Yes, sir, and I'll, I'll recognize Mayor Beats. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my response would be to the mayor that the plan of services submitted for the annexation would be the answer to your first question. When did you do? Am I correct in that, Lanice? Yeah. And, and the other one, I, I have a, uh, I have an itch uh, about the de-annexation process, uh, kind of like Mayor Rowland there. I, I can see me uh, 
and people wanting to be annexed, 100 properties, for instance. And based on that property tax increase, I go borrow some money from Bone Seavers to build a, a park in the middle of my city, and then those people wanting to de-annex, be de-annexed, and me being stuck, my old people, with paying off the note, plus those people would still have the the benefit of uh, of the park. I, I, I know that's a a stretch there, but it, it's certainly a possibility, and I, I, I'm not comfortable with that. Thank you, sir. And, and you're not the only member. I've had several others express concern about that, too. And again, it's a nettlesome issue that's going to take a lot of a lot of detailed analysis, and I think what we're trying to do is come up with the phraseology here that gets to Representative Odom's point. The, the commission recommends extension of the moratorium by one year or language to that effect uh, in order to uh, further drill down on these, on these issues that need further discussion. Um, Mr. Shumpert. Just for clarification, I think one of the reasons for de-annexation has been a real concern that the services have not been provided within the five years. That's right. Or within, that they're not provided, and so what's the alternative there? Right. So it's a two-edged, if you don't de-annex, what are you going to do to the city if they do not provide the service? Right, and in many cases, it's citizens don't have the the resources to sue and to pursue litigation to enforce their rights. Mayor Rowland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good point, Mr. Shumpert. And let me ask Representative Carter, he may be familiar with this. Uh, I believe an area in Hickson has asked to be de-annexed de -annexed from Chattanooga. And they had not been provided services. And also, if I read correctly, uh, the city has not assessed any property taxes over 10 years. Is that legal? Well, actually yeah. happened was there was a lawsuit filed and there was a settlement issued where they would not be taxed until December 31st this year. And then that, there have been no services because in our area, the county and its, municipal, uh, its, its utilities provide all the services. So Chattanooga annexes out, out the utility lines that the county builds. And so that's what happened to these folks. They get absolutely no service other than garbage pickup. Uh, their councilman last week moved for the city to de-annex it. Okay. Uh, on their uh, motion, it fell to five to four. Yeah, that's an unusual situation. It was. Thank yes. you, sir. All right. The parliamentary situation we are in is that we have before us the need to consider amending the uh, or a motion that would that would phrase this such that, given the commission's recommendation of an extension of the moratorium, it is to further consider or flesh out or make recommendations on the discussion points that are set forth in this report. Yes, sir. Representative Odom. Uh, it would seem you could proceed a couple of different ways with another point, uh, basically clarifying what the actual status of the law is today regarding the moratorium, or you could just simply add to this statement about continuing the examination of the of the laws dealing with annexation but uh, but we need to point out uh, as you had said earlier um, that exactly what the moratorium means what it applies to what it doesn't apply to and it's set forth in public chapter 441 a copy of which is is um, appended in your books it's the first um, the first document in it's uh, in the appendix um, A3. A3 you can see the the language of the of the uh, of the bill as amended before you public 440 public chapter 441 that notwithstanding the provisions of this part or any other law to the contrary from April 15 2013 through May 15 2014 no municipality shall extend its corporate limits by means of annexation by ordinance upon the municipality's own initiative pursuant to 651 102 in order to annex territory being used primarily for residential or agricultural purposes and except as otherwise permitted pursuant to subdivision a2 no such ordinance to annex such territory shall become operative during such period. As used in the subsection, municipality does not include any county having a metro form of government. And so what's been proposed is that the deadline be extended 
to not later than May 15, 2015, or uh, as such time as a as a another bill is is passed by the General Assembly dealing with the issues set forth in this report. All right, given the present posture, I'll entertain them. Yes, 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 ma'am. Mr. Chairman, as, Mr. as Representative Odom has pointed out, I think uh, we have adopted the report today, but I think it is also very important that we tell the legislature that this is a work in progress and that we have other, we have other questions have been raised that need time to be addressed so that we don't, to use uh, uh, Representative Carter's words, uh, we don't have unintended consequences that are going to put us in a jeopardizing situation. So I think that's very important. Uh, and I appreciate that. I think we would need another vote on, on adopting the report in its modified form, subject to the, the motion that's already passed on extension of the moratorium. And I'll entertain that motion. The center, would you like to make that? Ma Representative Odom makes that motion, seconded with Mayor Center, Vice Mayor Rowland. Discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstaining? It's unanimous. All right. Approved, and we will have that written up in, in form sufficient to um, to discuss, not only to transmit to the General Assembly, but to discuss further. Our work is not over. We'll be back here in January to, to uh, continue to focus on these discussion points. Questions, comments? Is anybody going to sing uh, any Christmas carols here today? He's thinking about it. He's been warming up those pipes. <laughs> Well, all right, great work, members. Thank you so much. And um, if there's nothing further for the good of the order, then we will adjourn until our January meeting in 2014. Thank you very much. Thank you.